Today's episode is absolutely incredible. My guest is Michelle Seeger. She's an award-winning NIH-funded researcher at the University of Michigan with almost 30 years studying how to help people adopt healthy behaviors in a way that matches the complexity and unpredictability of the real world. Um, She's an advisor to the World Health Organization and was named inaugural chair of the United States National Physical Activity Plans Communication Committee. Um, She has a perspective that's uniquely comprehensive. Uh, but she has so much education and background, just absolutely incredible. She's got a doctorate in psychology, uh, a PhD, a master's degree in health behavior and health education, and a master's degree in kinesiology and fellowships in translational research and healthcare policy from UM. Her book is so cool. It's called The Joy Choice. So we will link that up. Oh my gosh, she just gets it and she has so much research to back it up and education to back it up. Just absolutely incredible. If you've been having a hard time getting yourself to like sustain healthy habits that you would like to have, I really recommend picking up her book. Again, it's called The Joy Choice, How to Finally Achieve Lasting Changes in Eating and Exercise thoroughly enjoy this. Um, she mentions in the episode that she has a quiz cause she has these different like, uh, things that can hold you back and you can find, kind of find what are your big ones that are holding you back from being able to actually get lasting changes in your health. Um, and so you can go to her website. It's Michelle S E G A R. Um, and we'll link that up in the show notes as well. All right, let's get into it. Here is Michelle Seeger. Okay. So Michelle, I was telling you, I'm so excited. I think this is going to be a major geek out sesh for me. I do obviously have to do behavior change, doing holistic health coaching for people. And you're so educated in it. You're so respected in this area of expertise. And I love the title of your book, which is the joy choice. And so, um, you know, you, I know you specialize in helping people in terms of changing behavior in their health pursuits with eating and exercise. So can you share with us just a little background information on how you got so deep into this research? Yes. Well, something very specific did happen. It was in 1994 and I was just in my first year getting a master's in kinesiology and we were doing a study with cancer survivors to see Mm. if exercise could reduce depressive and anxiety symptoms. Cool. Right. So Um, you know, this is a long time ago. This is almost 30 years ago. Wow! And we found, you know, our assessments we had pre to post. And then we found that indeed the group that exercised did improve on these outcomes that we had hypothesized. But part of our study design was to call everyone back 30 years later, 30 years later, 10 weeks later, (laughs) and, um, do focus groups and talk to them. And the participants Mm. sat around smiling and laughing and talking about exercise. And a a one detail that you need to know is that these weren't um, uh, currently cancer patients. They were about four and a half years out of treatment. So living normal lives. And we were shortly shockingly to discover that despite all the smiles with the word exercise, Almost everyone had stopped doing it when our study ended. And mm. my my jaw dropped when I was hearing that over and over again. And so I did the normal thing that a curious 20-something does. And I asked, why? Why did you stop exercising? And they said, oh, my God, Michelle, do you have all day? I work. I have a family. I have kids. I have aging parents. I have this, that, and the other. I don't have time to exercise. So let's, let me pause there because (laughs) they had time to exercise for us in our study, but once the study ended, they stopped. And so what became very clear to me is that if people who have faced a life-threatening illness didn't have the, the belief system and skill set to sustain a self-care behavior, like exercise, um, we have a real problem in society. And it was that problem that grabbed me and shook me Mm -hmm. and said, Michelle, solve, solve me. And so everything I've done since then, you know, more education, developing my own coaching protocol and the research I do has been in service of solving that big hairy problem, which is why don't people sustain self-care behaviors like exercise and healthy eating? And most importantly, what methods and messages can help people turn that around? Mm. 
I love that you asked why it, just genuine curiosity, like how, what, and you know, <laughs> it's, it, once you have that established, like I have that habit established, it's, 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 it's bizarre to think how you could think that way. Right. Like, and I, and I used to, I used to, when I was a young mom, you know, it would go by the wayside. I'll get to it later, that kind of thing. But once you get hooked on and probably joy, which is really what drives me, right. I don't have body composition goals. I don't have specific like weightlifting goals. I'm trying to deadlift X amount of pound. I don't have anything like that. It's the joy that I experience and how good I feel that drives me to come back. So you know, in t- besides time, what else did you find in that journey that like really was like the deeper belief systems that cause people to quote unquote, not have time? Sure. And you know, what I say is not having time and not being motivated are smoke screens for what's really going on. And yes. it's not to say that people aren't busy. It's not to say that a single mom working three jobs, she doesn't have, I mean, there are some real legitimate Right. No time reasons, but m- moving aside from extreme conditions like that, I found that not not having time is a smokescreen for something very important. And maybe mm-hmm. the most important thing is all or nothing thinking mm-hmm. that people come to exercise or other things. Um, and I talk about this in the joy choice with mm-hmm. beliefs that you have to do it right right yeah. with air quotes, or it's not worth doing. And of course, we don't do most things right all the time, right? right. We don't parent right all the time. We don't <laughs> partner right all the time. We don't work right all the time. So for some reason, we have developed, no, not for some reason, we know why. We have learned, we've been socialized and indoctrinated to have a very myopic belief system when it comes to how we should exercise, how we should change our eating, why on earth we should even bother doing those things. And those influence the beliefs we have. And it's those beliefs that create an unstable foundation for our behavior. Okay. Let's dive into this. Okay. This is so fun. Um, so you have, let's say we have somebody who they're on some medications they're not sleeping well, maybe, you know, maybe they've got some digestive issues or like, they just feel like their brain's not working right. Or some, you know, things are not, they know things aren't, they're not feeling great. What, what are some common reasons that you have found that they like, don't do anything about it? You know what I'm talking about? It's just like, there's no, the, the, what there's no, is it not bad enough? Does it, has it just not occurred to them? It's like walking on Mars. You know what I mean? When people are in chronic poor health, and just avoiding it and not dressing it. What are some of the common, like underlying subconscious sure. belief systems you've seen with just not addressing it sure. at all? Well, a big reason people don't address things is because they failed in the past. Mm. And, and one of the reasons they failed and another big reason why they don't engage is because their expectations about what they need to do are too great, which gets back to the all or nothing thinking and the perfection decision disruptor, you know? um, And so it's a non-starter because the way people have learned to approach, think about, believe they need to change their behavior is is based on a formula that only works for a very small percentage of the population. Yeah. And so, you know, they've been set up to fail again and again and again. But the problem is, is they think it's their fault. They feel that there's something innately unhealthy about them, innately unmotivated, innately unathletic, right. when in fact, the the formula, the model that has been out in the world for the last four decades is based on the minority of the people that it has worked for. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's based on the research that looks at the health benefits and optimal doses of exercise and optimal doses of certain micronutrients for health. But that has nothing to do with how people actually not only change their behavior, but most importantly, can sustain it. Yeah. And I can, I mean, being in the trenches with people every single day, I can totally back up what you're saying because what happens and I I don't think I've ever had a client that didn't come to me in all or nothing thinking. Yes. And they usually have binge eating, binge and restrict, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll say things like I was being really good 
You see the good, bad thinking, the all right in that statement. I, w- I, I can be really good for a week or a month. And then I, it just all goes to crap. And that is, I'm like, that is all or nothing. That's what happens is that there's that expectation. Like you say, like I should be And a lot of times I find the expectation. They don't even know really what the expectation is. It That's just has correct. to be better than what I am now. And it, oh. it, it, it's the dangling carrot. It's no matter how far I get in this, it's got, I've got to be better. It's this deep subconscious program that's running. And what happens is as soon as you aren't perfect, which is the all or nothing thinking, well, I, <laughs> there's a movie Megamind. Have you seen the movie Megamind? I have children's movie. No. Oh my gosh. It's such a good movie. It's a cartoon movie and it was so good. So basically M- Megamind, he's like a villain, this guy, and he was bullied. They, t- they g- give his backstory and he was bullied really bad. And then he has this line where he says, so I decided if I was going to be bad, I was going to be really bad. And that is what happens with the good, bad, all or nothing yes. perfection thing you're talking yes. about is as soon as I, oh, well, I ate a cookie. I might as well go all the way in this very all in all out black, white thinking. It is literally, I would say perhaps the, in my experience, the biggest, what it, possibly the biggest stumbling block in people's health pursuits. It is. It is, you know, that's what, that's one of the things I wrote about in the book. And I've si- I've since heard other researchers that I greatly admire say the same thing. I mean, we, you know, all or nothing and what that leads to the, you know, the, I'm going to be really bad is the natural result of that paradigm. Like we have to target, like if we just target that, I mean, well, in a way I, I, I didn't mean to set myself up. For this so nicely, but that is what the point of the book is, is if we can teach people Mm -hmm. why this is and a joyful solution that they want to do, not that they feel that they should do, you know? And so, you know, something that you said that I think is really speaks to what's going on and why they, they don't really know what they're doing, but they're going to do it to be better because they need to Mm -hmm. people approach healthy lifestyle lifestyle changes in in ways that are focused on doing not being yeah. and we are human beings and if we treat these um health projects if you will as as a way to achieve certain outcomes right. that are outside of ourselves or even right. our whatever some kind of bullseye as opposed to helping us nurture who we are at our core and feel right. our best and fuel the, the the projects and people we care most about. Well, I mean, that is, that's why people don't stick with it. Right. Yes. It's a, it's a chore. It's a punishment. It's a stressor. It's a to-do list item. And it, yes. all these feelings of failure come in and it's so, you know, I, I, I cannot encourage people enough to get your book because like what I have found is like the solution to that, they don't even know what that looks like. That, that has been so deeply in that, like, yes. it's like walking on Mars for people to like under, to be like, Oh no, no. Well, you can have, like, I always tell people, I'm like, you can have, like, not only can you have a cupcake or a donut, you can go back to the shop and buy the whole store full and you can sit there and you can eat all of them. Like, and, and it, maybe this will segue into your, one of your other decision disruptors, you call yeah. them um, rebellion, but it causes when you're sitting there, like I call it mean mommy, your mean mommy's like, no, you can't have a donut, you know? And you're like, your little inner rebel comes out and it's like, watch me. And we do this to ourselves. But when you just give yourself, when there's no bully, when there's no mean mommy and you're just like, yeah, dude, you can have all the donuts you want. Like, of course you can have donuts. There's no rebel. And you can come into this mature energy and just say, okay, I, well, duh. Yeah. I know I can have, I, of course I can, I can have whatever I want. I got a credit card. I can, I've got a car, like I, of course, you know, and yeah, I'll let you take it, it from there. No, I mean, you're <laughs> what you're saying couldn't be more spot on when, and of course that's part of the old paradigm and mindset is there are all these rules and shoulds and doing right. it right means you do it this way. And, mm-hmm. you know, and the reality is, is that that creates this tension that causes people to think in perfectionistic ways and causes people to rebel. Yes. And let's flip the narrative, right? Mm-hmm. Like, let's say we thought about other areas of our lives where we don't do that, you know, yeah. where you're, 
um, someone calls you up, you know, I'm, I'm going to participate in this book club, you know, mm -hmm. and I wondered if you wanted to come and on this session, we can invite people. It's about this. You don't go, I have to go to the book club. Oh my <laughs> God. No, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Or <laughs> I'll go to part of it. No, we, but it, when it comes to eating or exercise, I have to do it this way. And when we take away the tension and we understand mm -hmm. that just like, you know, now some people do do everything the same, you know, like I have a husband who I call a habiter and he eats the same lunch every day and he gets up and unconsciously does his exercise every day because he's one of these few people who can work like that. But for the rest of us who are not that innately self-disciplined or can't control their life context in the same, you know, structured way that people like my husband are able to do it. We need to have a paradigm that isn't about you have to do it this way. It's here's a handful of ways to take care of yourself that get you on the path of where you're trying to go. Yeah. Um, and choice. Choice. Right. Yeah. And that when you feel a sense of choice, you feel ownership. Yeah. And when you feel ownership, you don't have the mean mommy telling you what to do. You're like, okay, well, I'm at the donuts shop. This is my favorite special food. And you know what? I am trying to eat in a certain way now, but you know, I'm going to have half of it because it's special. And I would yeah. feel resentful if I didn't have it. Yes. When you take away the tension, you open yourself up for more flexible thinking, which is what the research shows actually gets mm. more people to where they're actually wanting mm. to go. Oh, uh, thank you for that example. Yeah. I always Always, you know, I, I actually took away, I have Friday calls with all my one-on-one -on -one clients as a group. We used to call them accountability calls. And I used to say, what do you want to be held accountable for this week? And I, it just, it was rubbing me there. I was like, I don't like this. I don't uh -huh. like this. I don't like the energy of this. I don't like the feeling of this. It's this feeling of like, it's just what we talked about. It's this stressor. It's like, well, I told the whole group that I was going to read 10 pages of that book. So crap, I have to. Right. And so all I did was switch it because I kept saying, you don't have to do, we're just looking at how you make, you know, commitments and how you feel about the choices. If you change it, it's that word accountability, it was not working. And so I switched it to, what do you want to do this week? What do you want to do? Um, I think I want to call my daughter. Okay, cool. And then the next week, how did it, did you call your daughter? How to go, you know, with no pressure, just like, yes. it's okay. If you decided not to just as, as long as, you know, just making sure you're good with you yeah. and what you chose as life went on. And, but the quote unquote accountability went way up in the energy of the, if they didn't do it, they're like, no, well, I got sick. So I decided that was like, definitely a not an alignment this week. And I'm like, perfect. That's, Why is that freedom. I, <sighs> you know, that word accountability is I, I consider that, um, a pat, I consider that world, that word, part of the old story of behavior change where yes. we've learned that we have to, we, why, of course we wouldn't want to do it. And if we don't want to do it, then we need to be accountable to someone outside of yeah. ourselves, but accountability. So I think on the one hand, it does create a really harmful motivational, um, context. Now I'm not saying there aren't some people that it's going to work for, but if we're talking about sustainable change mm -hmm. and internalizing the value of doing consistent decision-making around this, you don't want to be accountable to someone else. The other thing I think accountability is a smokescreen for is it's hiding connection. So mm. oftentimes people think I need accountability, but it might just be, I want to exercise with someone that I feel connected to and enjoy spending time with. And yeah. right. Yeah. And yeah. connection is a uh, one of the strongest human motivators we have. So if mm -hmm. we can make, if we can help link our um, well-being choices and behaviors to connection, then wow, are we elevating it to something mm -hmm. really meaningful and motivating? Oh, I love that you hit on that. Yeah. Cause even, you know, on those calls, like somebody would be like, no, I didn't. I'm actually really struggling right now. And it, like that creates connection, you know, and so a bunch of other people be like, I am too, I'm with you, you know, and like that gives them this like strength. It feels like this, like, it's okay. This loving space. And to me, that's where it's at. Like I don't eat a few hours before bed. I don't do that because like I can't, or I'm trying to be skinny or like I, somebody told me to, or like, like, 
I, of course I can, I can any, any night I want, I could eat before bed, but I don't want to, because I'm driven by how good I feel in the morning when I don't do that. So it's like, dude, of course you can eat all these things, you know, but like, I, I, I want, but I want to feel good tomorrow, you know, and every once in a blue moon, I'm like, dude, I'm really hungry. Like, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. And then I wake up and I don't feel as good. And I'm like, okay, noted, you know, and it's just that very peaceful place of want to, I want to work out. I want to eat healthy because it, it it's self-honoring. It makes me feel good. Self-honoring. And, you know, I think feeling good is the data that, I mean, that both consciously and unconsciously that drives the ongoing choice to, again, not to be perfect, but to make a choice that, you know, helps you feel better. And yeah. instead of yeah. feeling good or better as the, the levers of change or the things people are focusing on, we've been taught we should be focusing on stepping on the scale and we should be focused on, you know, making sure that we tell our physicians or clinicians what they want to hear when really the seek the secret sauce is that when we learn it's a learning process. Yes. When we learn how our choices make us feel, both, you know, the run that you that I used to love taking that I can't take anymore just because of knee issues. But mm -hmm. when I, you know, and how it you, when I don't run, you know, when I was running and how mm -hmm worse I felt, but, or when I choose to eat something that I, you know, mm -hmm. but, but when we come at these choices, um, with it, with the rigidity, yeah. because, and, and that's where the all or nothing and the perfection can still sabotage it. Because yes. when people say, well, I know I feel better if I don't eat past 7 PM say, mm -hmm. but they're at a party. Yeah. And it's a special occasion. And they say, I can't eat past seven because they, but then they have this other part of them that's like, but I'm at a party and I want to participate and I want to feel yeah. like I'm so. And when we teach people to be more flexible in these situations, yes. it strips away the need to rebel. It strips away right. the need to write. Yes. People ask me that, right? Because they know that I kind of do that. And they'll be like, yeah. well, what if you're like at a dinner and it's late? I'm like, oh, I just eat like it. it that's, that's fine. <laughs> like, you know, it's, there's, it's total fluidity. And yes. even let's say, you know, I, um, I was telling my clients about this. Like I, I was out in California last weekend. It was the day before my period. I get very hungry the day before my period. I had, you know, I, I just had a very pretty taxing weekend, like probably consumed a lot of calories. Plus the, you know, I mean, used, burned a lot of calories plus day before my period. I was so hungry. And I went to air one, like, I don't know if you know those grocery stores okay. um, with my friend who lives in LA. And I was like, literally cannot get enough calories in my body. Like I am ravenous. So I got some pizza and carrot cake. Okay. Yes. That's very abnormal. Like not unusual thing. I eat. I don't have anything, you know, yes. problems with that. I just don't usually choose those kind of foods. Yes. And when I woke up the next morning, plus having like a not regular sleep schedule that I'm used to, I felt not good. Like my legs felt really achy. I felt more groggy and it, but it wasn't like this, like, Oh, bad Tara. Yes. Bad, like you look what you did to yourself or anything like that. It was just, it's just this noticing it's like, Oh yeah. So I just was taking my fish oil and my algae and, you know, my gut supplements and drinking water. And I was like, hey, you know, you'll be okay, body. Let's go work out and kind of work some of this out. And like, it, you know, it's just, it's no big deal when it's you no big deal. <laughs> like that's like, that should be the name of your book. It's no <laughs> big deal because that is that that's what we're talking about that we yeah. need to teach people now. You know, it often comes up and I think it's important to say that you know, some people feel addictive um issues with certain yes. foods and yes. you know, this approach may not work for people who have physiological you know, physiological type things, going yeah. type things going on and right and so I think it's important to say, because people always ask, but I have, you know, I feel like I'm addicted to sugar and when I eat sugar, mm -hmm. everything, well, it's again, knowing yourself, right? Yeah. Like it's having the self-awareness and it's a, it's a journey of learning mm -hmm. instead of a bullseye. That's what people, I think. And I think the ship is turning where, you know, wonderful coaches like yourself are teaching people this new mindset, which is look people, it's not about getting that arrow and practicing so that you can hit that little red dot on the wall every time. It's like the whole room is the target. So just yeah. getting out 
and like going through the motions and, and learning how to do it is, a, is, is a success. It's yeah. redefining success away from a bullseye to something is better than nothing because in life, that's, that's a truism for the most part. Something mm-hmm. is better than nothing. Yeah. And if you can take this energy, even with addictions, all addictions, I've learned any addiction and just this noticing being like noticing. So it's like, okay. Cause let's say somebody has undiagnosed candida or something, or they have like severe trauma or like their nerve, their nervous system is kind of wrecked. Their neurotransmitter balance is off and they're craving sugar literally because they're low dopamine. Right. And they don't know that, but if you can start to just move with the energy like this and be like, I've noticed huh? I've no, I've noticed triggers. I've noticed if I don't meditate and exercise, I crave sugar more those days. I wonder if the, I, there could be something neurochemical going on. Like when you move with it like that, you'll find more, I think addictions are clues. We have <laughs> inner wisdom mm-hmm. and you know, the interesting thing. And I remember the first time I heard about this research about smoking cessation that I learned about years ago. Um, I, um, you know, with physical activity, when you notice how you feel and it's important that you feel some type of positive experience, if, if least, at least if not palatable, if it's punishing, you won't keep doing it. Right. And that's part of the recipe for sustainability. But what about smoking? Like wood or eating does noticing craving in some ways you would think, wow, that's going to make it worse. So to bring awareness, but, but the research doesn't show that the research shows that when you notice how you feel without judgment, it actually gives you a greater self wisdom that lets you, um, it's not this, um, unconscious craving that you're ignoring so that it just takes over when you bring conscious awareness, you know, your prefrontal cortex to the situation, you're actually taking away some of the energy, the emotional energy that can just take over sometimes. Oh, I love this. And I think that the phrase you said without judgment is crucial. Like if that's going to, you know, so if you're, I, I mean, cause I used to have binging type eating behaviors, super restricted. Like I wasn't, you know, and I've come out of this and what, so I, I've walked that walk and I know what it feels like. It's this little, like, it's like this little gremlin in your mind that you're not processing that. It's like, don't, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. You know, you're not going to do it. Yeah. I kind of am. No, I'm not. Yeah, it's like, it's like horrible. And instead now it's just the freedom to choose without, it's just like, I'm noticing that I'm like, you know, when I, when I was really hungry last weekend, it's just like, dude, I'm definitely noticing I am yes. starving, yes. starving. And I just allowed it. I just ate. That's Ooh, right. You know, and everything worked out. Everything was fine. And you know, <laughs> it is, that is what it is. It's, it's freedom. It's liberation. Yeah. And then you are free to make choices that are, that are, going to help you maximize Mm -hmm. your different needs. You have a need Mm -hmm. to eat a certain way in general. You have your, your physiological, you have a physiological experience of, of real hunger. That's a, that's a different need. And you're on vacation in LA, a different need. So instead of having this rule book, okay, what am I supposed to do in this situation? Or I have to do this when we can learn to live in the dynamic nature of our days, yeah, it, it gives us freedom to choose. And again, maybe we overdo it, especially at the beginning. Cause you're like, Oh, I'm free to, to do whatever. Yes, yes. And then, but that's where the learning comes in. Cause we're talking yes. about the rest of our lives. So right. you're not going backwards. Every experience you have that you become aware of and you, and you log in, you say, Oh, you know what? I was free to do that. And I feel good about that. But I noticed mm-hmm. that I I overdid it a little bit because of how it made me feel. So the next time I'm in that situation, right. yeah. Extract the lesson. Yes. Just extract the lesson. And it's, it's a positive. You know, I always yes. say the only way you can quote unquote fail. I don't believe in failure. The only yes. way you can quote unquote fail is if you didn't learn anything from it and you're just sitting yes. there shaming and judging yourself. That's it. If you learned something from it, it was very valuable. Um, yeah. And I, I think you kind of hit on something I, I think is so important as well. And like, I always say like, you're not going to master some, if we mastered everything, like we would all be Michael Jordans and Andre Agassi, like it, you know what I mean? Like, you're not going to master new mindsets and habits. Like 
quickly. Like it takes time, you know? And I think that like, what, so can I take my clients through this process where yeah. it's like with like binge eating restrict and binge cycles, which is incredibly common. If you're listening, like you are like, especially if you've ever tried to lose weight and you found yourself binging, you're like, literally, I don't know hardly anyone who hasn't been in that place, you know, or at least overeating episodes. Right. And so what I, I have found with them, my first thing is this, you can eat whatever you want. Remind yourself, you have to get there. weight. not 99%. It has to be a full being like knowing that, yes, of course I can eat whatever I want. Second is how I have them think, how, how am I going to feel after I eat that thing? So I literally will have them pretend that they ate it. It's five minutes later. How do I feel? And just notice, and that's all still giving yourself permission to do it, but just kind of notice that. And then, um, is there something else I could eat that would help me that kind of gives me that fix, right? Like, Oh, could I make that Greek yogurt bowl with like the, you know, stevia sweet and chocolate chips and granola? Oh yeah. That sounds just as good as like this, these brownies, yum, you know, that brings me joy. And then I continuing to notice how you feel. Well, when I take somebody who's in severe binging right now and they get it, it, sometimes they go into the, yeah, I can eat whatever I want, but that little monster is still in there being like, yeah, don't do it. They're not all the way there. Right. So sometimes you'll have hiccups on this journey. I was kind of hearing that what you're saying. It's like, it takes time to really, I mean, you're basically reprogramming your subconscious. That's mind. right. That's <laughs> your sub you're reprogramming both. I think your subconscious and, and your conscious mind. Totally. And if you don't, um, and, and I think appreciating that it's a process, yeah. it's not a light switch. It's a process that also can be freeing yes. because you don't have to get it exactly right, yes. right now. It's, it's be having, <laughs> yes. And the, the right support, the right paradigm, mm-hmm. um, the, the right framework, because again, I think, um, when people first hear about this type of perspective or before they hear about it, they often blame themselves and they feel that they failed going back to what you said earlier. And they understanding that the system has set them up to fail not only is important so that they don't feel like failures. It's also important to understand that there's other newer systems that are based on um, a more modern um, psychological science, behavioral science. That's also based on a more um, accurate information about how our brains work. right? Right. If you said, you can't have good um, gas mileage based on cars that were made in the 1960s. Well, that would have been true in the 1960s, but we have cars that can have, because of the technology, and the same thing is true with our approaches to yeah. change. We have better technological approaches. And I don't mean love technology. It. I'm talking about mm-hmm. the knowledge base, if you yes. will, about what we know. Our mental technology, our, yes. our what what we've learned about human behavior and how we work and tick and talk. It's more advanced. That's exactly right. Okay. I want to get into chapter three of okay. your book because I love the title of this chapter, Why We Don't Just Do It. Oh my gosh. Okay. So like I kind of live uh, in this world that I, I'm still have like one foot kind of in the resistance training, almost bodybuilding, like, you know, the hardcore, like just do it types, like, you know, no excuses and all that stuff. And then, and I, and my other foot's kind of in this like very holistic spiritual, uh, you know, self-honoring, uh, what's best for me kind of mentality. And so it's really interesting to observe these world. It's really interesting. And, and I, sometimes we, I see it in both, but why did you, why did you do a whole chapter on why we don't just do it? Just because that is what I see so much. It's like, yep, just freaking like this sucks. Just put your head down, just do it. When I hear people say that, that are like, I don't know, even like health professionals, like I hate working out, but I do it anyway. I'm like, yeah, (laughs) well, that's, that's part of the old story of behavior change. Like there's this whole vernacular and, you know, I have, you know, a dictionary old terms, better terms, right. And just do it is an old phrase that came out of a mentality and exercise that also, you know, that came out of research um, partly that in order to achieve some type of optimal physiological benefit from exercise, you have a certain dose that you need to have of, you know, cardiovascular, you know, Uh where, what, you know, heart rate. So there were, there's a dose response. And so 
we learned early on that we did need to do it a certain way and that we just needed to do it to get that dose. But well, it doesn't work for most people. And, you know, the just do it might be a great slogan for a company that's selling shoes, but for your average Joe or Jane, who's got a family and a job and all these other things, people don't have energy to just do it again and again and again. They may have energy to do it for two weeks on New Year's, but that's, that's, we go back to the vicious cycle of failure where- Mm -hmm. The all or nothing thinking, that's mm-hmm. what just do it reflects. Just do yes. it reflects. This is what you should do. And yes. gosh, darn it, do it. But what if instead of just do it, it was do something and it can be a whole bunch of different things. And maybe on any given day, you, exercise is typically what you need to boost your mood. But but you know, for whatever reason, you know that you need a huge night of sleep but and if that means that you're going to have to miss your workout in the morning because you have body wisdom you know that that good night of sleep is this that's part of why the just do it is gets us focused in the wrong direction because it's focused on this one thing and it doesn't treat us as having these holistic set of self-care needs right totally. that we have to and part of our self-care needs include our in our email inbox and our relationship with our children and friends. Mm -hmm. And, and if we don't learn to consider eating and exercise and sleep, et cetera, as part of this, you know, potpourri of self-care needs, then we don't learn how to um, slice and dice them when we need to throughout the dynamic nature of our days, because Mm -hmm. life is dynamic. And if if success means we have to do it, just do it, mm-hmm. then, and we can't do it, then we do nothing. Yeah. There's like a, there's like an ego win in the just do it mentality. And I've worked with a lot of people coming out of the just do it mentality. And I'm here to say they're miserable. They are miserable. It's, it's basically self-abandonment, right? It's like, I feel like crap. I like can't even see straight. Cause I probably have some underlying health issues or some emotional stuff that hasn't been processed, but I'm going to go ahead and get four and a half hours of sleep anyway. Cause I'm just going to do it. You just got to do it. You got to be tough. You got to be hard. Like, you know, and it's like, it's, you know, as you talk about this, I think how big of sitting ducks we all were because we all have been because in as children, when you're subconscious is being formed, this is kind of the, like, it's like, it's not about like what you want to do, even in schools or at home. It's, it's like what you should be doing. You should be doing this and you should be doing that. And good girl, bad girl, good boy, bad boy, you know? And it's like, it's tough to manage because that serves a place, obviously in classroom management, you can't just have kids doing whatever they want. Like it's understandable why that happens, but we have to relook at this as an adult. It's like, am I still looking at life through my like kindergarten lens of like, I have to do things the quote unquote right way, or I'm good or bad. If I do it the right way, I'm good. And I get my gold star. And if I do it the wrong way, I'm bad and should sit in the corner or like outside of the classroom, you know, like we have to re-examine these patterns. Absolutely. I mean, and even as, as a, as a parent to a 14 year old, you know, who thinks, who has been very curious about the educational system, you know, (laughs) project-based learning is, you know, not sitting down and memorizing so you can regurgitate. How does that help most people with a professional career? Now we have problems that we have to solve and we have to solve them working with other people collaboratively. So even the education model is changing because it doesn't work in the modern day. Yeah. With the new technology we have yes. and we're, we're getting there little by little. Okay. I wanted to also hit on chapter six. So, so in the book, you guys, she has these decision disruptors. There's four of them. There's temptation, rebellion, accommodation, and perfection. What do you mean by accommodation? So that's kind of the sore thumb. That's the different one um, than temptation, rebellion, um, and perfection accommodation reflects it's it's point it's the point where you're supposed to leave to take your hour walk okay and the phone rings and it's a a really good friend and and because you want to make sure that you're there for her no matter Mm. what because it's so important for you to be a good friend Mm. you forego your Mm. your walk so that you can pick up the phone and give your friend what you need Mm -hmm. now Sometimes we do need to do that, 
But when you always do that, or when you always give what someone hands you, even though you actually don't want to eat it at all so that you don't hurt their feelings, what you're doing is you're accommodating um, your your own self-care needs. And so mm-hmm. this is where you consistently and all the time, not sometimes, privilege the needs of other people in your work above your own decisions for self-care, whether we're talking about what to eat or when to go to sleep or what, you know, exercise. And um, I, when I was trying to think of what to call this, because it's a very common thing. And sometimes people think women just do it, you know, men do it too. And it might be more prevalent among women. I'm not sure, but Mm -hmm. it's something that we do. And it's, it's it's in a way it's a deeper seated decision mm-hmm. disruptor because it has mm-hmm. to do with our even unconscious beliefs about what makes us worthwhile yes. and yes. needing to be nice and caregivers yes. of other people and but you can see how that can derail your decision to take care mm-hmm. of yourself mm-hmm. so part of um overcoming that common decision disruptor is just being aware of it. And then Mm -hmm. when you learn to think in more flexible ways, Mm -hmm. you don't, it's not all or nothing. It's not like, oh my gosh, do I take that? Do I leave the door right now and not pick up my phone? Or do I pick up the phone? There's options. You can pick up the phone and say, I know you're going through a hard time right now, but this is right when I was going to take my walk is how about if I walk for 30 minutes and I call you back or I walk and talk with you, you know, let me get my other phone to call you back on. Um, I can't talk to you now because I have to do this thing, Mm -hmm. but later after dinner, I'll give you a call. So Mm -hmm. once we start to think in more creative and flexible ways, we transcend the all or nothing thinking that really Mm -hmm so often gets in our way of doing anything. Mm -hmm, mm, I love that you put this in the book. And in addition to your book, the joy choice, like, uh, cause I lived through this. Okay. I was like one of the worst people pleasers ever. That was definitely like my childhood trauma response was like the fawn response of just like, okay. Yeah. Like didn't even think about, I didn't even know I was doing. It was so unconscious. Mm -hmm. It, it, It was, I call it, I come last mentality. And I had no idea I was even doing it. Right. Until I started to do some deeper work. So if that sounds like you, uh, the, the book, the art of saying no, and Terry Cole's book boundary boss, those are really helpful because what happens is like, you're, because you haven't processed any of that childhood trauma, you're filled with so much tremendous guilt. Like if it's like my, you know, my, I think that my family needs me to make them breakfast and I'm going to go to the gym instead. I, and I haven't worked through any of that stuff. I'm going to just, I I'm going to be, I I will avoid it. I will avoid the pain, the pain of the guilt and shame for not making them a pancake breakfast when they could make it themselves like that pain. I will avoid that pain, you know? And so getting deeper into those, like, honestly, like therapist books and things on codependency boundaries saying no, like if, if that's you. And then the other thing I'll say is this is a little like hard, hard, uh, real talk. But for me, I, I learned too, that like, you can kind of blame, you can go into this, like blame it. Well, I can't. Cause my kids need it. like, you don't really actually want to do the exercise or the healthy meal, but you say, well, I can't. Cause like it, it, that will be, my kids will, they need me, you know? So it's kind of this, it's all wrapped into that kind of like victim. I'm not in control of my life. Other people need me. I'm such a good person. Cause I accommodate everyone. And I think I love that you put that in your book. Well, I've seen it, you know, I've been coaching people with these issues for so long. And this is one of the key reasons that people don't sustain Um, self-care behaviors like physical activity. And so, you know, people aren't used to thinking about this topic in a book on exercise or healthy eating, but it is a core part of it for many people. So if you don't address it again, it's like, we can deal with things superficially, like Mm -hmm. make your exercise plan, do your plan or you (laughs) say, right. (laughs) And, And even pick an exercise that's positive. But if you have these issues, they are going to derail your decisions to exercise. So that's why we've got to know what they are. And by the way, there's a quiz on my website that people Mm. can identify which of the four decision disruptors might be most undermining their goals. Nice. And then uh, your website is just your name, correct? Yeah. Michelle, how do you say your last name? Seeger. Seeger, S-E-G-A-R. Yes. Dot com. Um, okay, cool. I'll, we'll link that up in the show oh, notes. Thank you. Um, also I, there was another chapter I wanted to kind of get into, um, 
Because you're talking about in, in chapter nine, you talk about supporting working memory. I'm kind of on like a bender with like ADHD research right now. So it's like a lot about working memory yes. and, and simplification. And um, I actually was talking to someone with ADHD yesterday and they were saying, oh, like cooking is so overwhelming for me. Like I can't get myself to cook. And I was like, well, for me, it's just been like, I've learned these little like streamlined. I'm like, I don't really cook either, but I've learned these little streamlined things I can do that. I don't really have to that much. You know, if I just, when I come home from shopping, if I put a bunch of, you know, roast in a crock pot, like that's not really cooking, but then I have like all this meat, you know what I mean? So, um, can you talk about what you mean by in this chapter, simplify supporting working memory? Yes. Well, you know, as you know, one of the premises of this book is that, we need to bring more consciousness to um, our exercise and eating projects. And in, it, we've been told, it's very popular to, to be told um, we should form automatic habits so we don't have to think at all. Um, but that unfortunately um, necessitates um, circumstances in our lives that are the same all the time. Right. And so this, if, if most people can't create an automatic habit for exercise or healthy eating, um, contrary to the wildly popular advice that's out there, yeah. what's, what's going to help people? Well, it's yeah. actually learning systems of thinking mm. that work in the chaotic and mm. hectic lives mm. that we live. And so yeah. that is our executive functioning. And as you know, from your deep dive into ADHD that you're doing, that is the system that um, is, is, uh, has some deficits with ADHD and in, you know, they're depending on what field you're talking to, they talk about different primary executive functions, but in the field of eating, they talk about three primary executive functions, working memory, inhibition, and, um, cognitive flexibility. And you asked me about working memory and that's the space in our not literal space. It's the, it's the part of our brain, a part of our executive function that is responsible for holding and working with information. So if I'm going into the kitchen to do something and all of a sudden, you know, I hear my dog barking at the, at the mailman, and I'm afraid that he's going to run out and do something. All of a sudden I forget Mm -hmm. what I was walking for because our working memory can only hold a couple of pieces of information at a time. And so, well, how can we use that? How can we support our working memory for sustainable change? Well, like your, you, your example was a perfect example. You have something that is really easy for you. You know, if you put meat, you know, however you said a roast, Mm -hmm. then you have created a system that's very easy or if you needed to remember a recipe and you could create an acronym for something, yeah. the ABC of this, then you can recall, you can um, recall it more easily without, without, with, within the limitations of our brain. Now, um, even though we may not have ADHD, we live in an environment where our our working memory is just being overwhelmed all the time. So Mm -hmm. that's why I thought it was important. And and it doesn't sound very sexy. I mean, working memory (laughs) is about the least sexy term I can think about when I'm talking about these topics. But once you learn about it, it's really cool. Um, And there are really simple ways. And, you know, that's the POP decision tool that I designed to help people in the moment of a challenge. Oh no, my friend's on the phone and I want to go out for my walk. Well, if you pop your plan, you pause, give yourself a space to go, mm. okay, this is an opportunity to choose. Mm. Oh, opportunity to choose. And then pick the joy choice. And the joy choice is love that. the perfect and perfect option that lets us do something instead of nothing. It's the antidote to all or nothing thinking, but it supports our brain because it guides our thinking. We don't have to come up. Oh gosh, what do I need to know? I need to pop, pause, open up my options and pick the joy choice. It's so empowering, right? I have times like that too. It's like, you know what? I normally get in bed at eight 30, but this Tuesday, there's this thing going on this, you know, I want to go support. I I just choose that, that I know what I'm doing. I know I'm choosing that. I know I'm going to need a little more sleep in the morning. It's going to kind of alter my day a little, uh, it's worth it to me. I choose that, you know, and just being good with it. What I hear a lot is like, just choosing it. And I love that you talked about the pause. That's like, I, especially overcoming people pleasing codependent type behaviors. 
I have learned the pause is so important. Cause it's like, I used to seriously, like someone would text me and be like, Hey girl, do you want to go to, you know, girlfriend, do you want to go to coffee on Friday? The old me people, it would be like, yes, can't wait. I wouldn't even look at my calendar. I didn't even think right. about it. It was just like, yes, I want you to know how much I care about you and want to see you. And then I'd have to like, be like, what am I, I'm going to be out of town on Friday. What am I talking about? And I have to do the classic people pleaser. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm like, not even going to be here and reschedule and all this. So for me, it was wait, <laughs> hold on. And it, the, my two questions are, do I have the bandwidth and do I want to? Right. Those questions have been so helpful. And you can't do it if you don't pause. And, you know, it's yeah. so funny. I was almost embarrassed to call it pause because, mm. you know, the idea of the pause has been around for thousands and thousands of years and everyone advocates it. But there's a reason for that. Yeah. It's because yeah. it's essential. Yeah, a lot of humans essential. have figured out that helps. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, I think for me, I love also, you mentioned like principles, like, you know, and so like, I think that that is just so key for flexibility, right? Like if, if I, people tell me all the time, like, I just want a meal plan. I just want to follow it to a T and I just kind of like blink my eyes and I'm like, <laughs> like, okay, well, I can, I can, I can give you that. What happens when you're at your daughter's gymnastics, uh, camp and you can't make four ounces of fish. And you know what I mean? I'm like, we got to work off principle. So for me, it's like, I know I want pro ideally protein, fat, and carbs at every meal. I want them to be as high quality as possible, but it's also okay if I'm on the go when it's not the perfect. And it's like, how can I fill in those gaps? Right. And then when I grocery shop, it's like, I have all these little things. I know. I, I know. I like that Greek yogurt bowl. I know that sometimes I'm going to want like some chips. So I get like the healthier chips and dip them in cottage cheese. I have that. Sometimes I'm going to want some veggie thing. Sometimes I'm going to want fruit, you know, it's like knowing, but that all comes from that knowing yourself, knowing like, you know, and you, you, when you started on your journey, you didn't know that that's the other thing. People mm -hmm. look at role models like you and you, you know, or, or me or whoever and say, they know everything they, but you, but you learned it. You were in yeah. the process of learning. And that is why it's not about this high stake bullseye thing about mm -hmm. right now, or even in the next month, it's about, you know, it's about a lifetime of learning. And, yes. you know, there may have been a time when we dated that hot person, but that was a short term thing. And, but that's how we approach exercise fads or eating yeah. fads. It's like, yeah, you learn, no. you it's learn. like, do you want a <laughs> lifelong relationship that's fulfilling or do you want to just keep you know, doing Raising whatever your dopamine, <laughs> yeah. you know, doing what is in fashion, but may not be a good fit for you. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my goodness. This is such an amazing episode. Thank you so much. Thank you for like going so far with this and showing up. And I hear that energy of like that calling of like, come on, like show up to the plate on this one, show up to the plate and you answered it. And, um, I can't, I, I seriously, want all my clients to read your book now. So thank you so much for coming on. We'll link up your book, your, uh, the quiz directly on your website in the thank show notes. You. And thank you. Just thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be on your show. And you asked such phenomenal questions. I love when I get an opportunity to speak to someone who really has a deep knowing and curiosity. And then we have this awesome exchange yeah. and learning, co-learning, right? So Exactly. I, I knew we would geek out hard. So <laughs> thank, so you, thank so you. All right. Take care. You too.